So I'll, I'll give you ways here to go through things. For example, if you have your book, chapter 18, whenever you have time, you can go back and look through things and help organize. They have other charts in there that might help you guys out as well too. So I just want to make sure, any questions with dates before we start the material? So <clears throat> again, these slides I just took from the publisher. I, I deleted some of them just to kind of keep them at a certain limit. But this is their organization of how things are going. There's going to be the intro that we'll do today. It's going to be pretty short. And we'll talk about some hormones and their mechanisms. We won't finish that today, but we'll get into it. So you'll learn like the different classes of hormones. For example, uh, what, what hormones are going to be coming from the pancreas important for pancreas, important for diabetics? Insulin. And then there's going to be the opposite of that is going to be glucagon. <coughs> Insulin acts to increase. I'm just trying to get you guys thinking about this. Insulin is going to act to increase or decrease blood glucose levels. It's going to decrease. Because diabetics, they eat food, mostly carbs, breaks down to sugars. They have high blood glucose. So insulin, they take it after meals to lower the sugar level. Again, these are details we'll get into more specifically when we get there. I'm just trying to get you guys to think about it. The thyroid, definitely a very important one. I'm sure somebody here might want to say something. Anybody with hyper, hypo, parathyroid? Anything to say? Yes, Emery? It's a, I mean, it doesn't have to be about anybody specific, but what do you know or anything about it? Which one would that be? Hyper or hypo if you're tired? Yeah, I'd be tired, lethargic. So hyper would be the opposite. Yeah, you will get a goiter from both of them as well too. That's another thing, Jamie. I haven't heard of it. If you do, you can let me know. But either it's going to be one or the other. Again, if it, maybe there's something rare like that. Maybe it's half, half. I don't, I don't know. I can't say 100%. I've never heard of it. Anybody know anything else about hyper, hypo, somebody remove a thyroid, it's lots of these things happen. With weight as well too. Which one's gonna be gaining weight? Hyper or hypo? Hypo. Hypo, you're tired, you're lethargic, you're not moving, you're gaining weight. Other things that could be dealing with uh, hair loss. There's lots of things. So when you think about the thyroid hormone and you think about what it affects, the answer is almost everything. It affects everything, your metabolism. It affects hair, it affects uh, depression or anxiousness, depending on hyper or hypo. So that, that's a very big one there. And that's why if you don't have it, then you have to take medication. Anybody know the medicine that substitutes for that? Yes. And see, it's very common that you guys know that, the synthroid. So we'll talk about that. Parathyroid has a hormone, the PTH, you've seen that in AP1. We're talking about bones. It's regulating what in blood, a level of something. You got calcium. The adrenal gland is in the name. What's going to come out of there? Adrenaline. Adrenaline, also known as epinephrine. Norepinephrine would be the same as noradrenaline. But there's more than just adrenaline that comes out of there. There's aldosterone. It's a tough one, but you've seen this before. AP1. Aldosterone has an effect on what organ of the body? I'll give you a second to think about that. AMP1 is the last unit, aldosterone, what organ, the body, yes, the kidney, cell reabsorption. So aldosterone is coming from above the kidney, that's where these glands are located. And also cortisone or cortisol will be coming out of there. Uh, the sex hormones, the androgens, there's a bunch coming out of there as well too. So we'll be looking at all those. There's a lot of hormones coming from the gland above the kidneys, the supra, superior to the renal gland or adrenal gland. And then the pituitary glands, where in the body you should know this one? In the brain. Right above it, you have the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, if you break that name apart, is below the what? Is below the thalamus. So that's going to be a very important area. So when we come next time, and if you have time to look ahead, if you don't, I understand. But if you do, we're not going to go in this order. We're going to start talking about the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. Because those are the two that control the majority of all of these other hormones, the release of it. I'll break it down in a system I made, like level one, level two, level three type thing. But pituitary gland and hypothalamus, if you want to start reading ahead or looking into that, there's lots of clips online and things that will show you, videos. I always give you an idea so next time you can see it.
And then we'll talk about each of these individually, because these are like the, the bottom of the line. Everything starts at the top in the brain at the pituitary and the hypothalamus. So this slide here is basically what we just did. It's making you think about the endocrine system and what it is. So I'm just going to move on from there. So just showing you where the location of some of these things are, the hypothalamus, pituitary, uh, thyroid. Where's our thyroid gland if you're seeing up there? What region of our body? Yeah, the neck. What do we call the neck region? Yeah, the cervical. So it's located in there. The parathyroid are four little dots that will be on top, two on each side. So you see those over there. The heart has its own hormones, which uh, we're not going to get into. And then over here, we have the other glands. Suprarenal. Suprarenal are located where, if you're looking up there? Above the kidneys. So it's, it's in the name again. That's what I'm trying to show you. <coughs> it's in the name. Above, superior to the kidneys. And then the pancreas, insulin, and glucagon. Glucagon will be doing the opposite of insulin, such as if you uh, don't eat for a long time, then glucagon will be released to do what to blood glucose levels, to increase or decrease it, to increase it. So it's doing the opposite. You eat, insulin decreases. You don't eat for a long time, technically an hour, glucagon will be secreted to help increase it. So again, all of this is just an intro. So I'm going to show you a clip here. And after this clip, I want you guys to start writing things in. You'll see blanks coming up. So let me give you something to look for when you're watching this clip. Okay. So when we talk about the nervous system, and I'm going to start comparing nervous system to endocrine system. The nervous system, what do we call the chemicals that travel through neurons? The neurotransmitters. They travel through neurons. They travel at the connections. What are the connections between neurons? Synapses. So pay attention to the name of the chemicals in the endocrine. Well, you should know that already. What do we call the chemicals here? Not neurotransmitters. We call them hormones. So pay attention to one, how the hormones travel through the body. And then two, uh, how they get into what we call target cells, the cells that they want to have their effect on. So again, pay attention to one, how they travel through the body, and two, how they uh, get to the cells they need to get to. There's two ways that they do that. So pay attention to the, those uh, two things. So watch how they get to the cells. So I'll repeat that part.
Let's see if you guys uh, picked up on this note here. So we're using chemical messengers. The chemical messenger, <coughs> what are they called again? Hormones. These chemicals travel through what? Uh, travel through the bloodstream. So things I'm going to start to do is just compare. And you'll see this in the textbook as well too. It's a common thing we talk about endocrine. Is you compare the nervous system to the endocrine system. It's, you can start to design or formulate a little chart here. So you, you'll have two columns. And then you can have multiple rows of what you're comparing. For example, one thing you could say is the chemical name. So the chemical name in the nervous system, what do we call that? Neurotransmitter over an endocrine hormone. But another category you can make here is how they travel. Neurotransmitters travel through what? I heard synapses or the name of neurons. Uh, nerve cells, neurons. Okay. Endocrine travels through bloodstream. And there's going to be more things you can write on top of that as well, too, that I'll tell you as we go along. So that, that's a nice little chart that will help you to compare. Again, when I tell you comparing nervous and endocrine, you can start to add rows to this chart as we go along. So bloodstream. Now, uh, sorry, was there a question? Okay, so if you look back at that video, so that you answered one of the questions. The other one, there was two ways for hormones <coughs> to get to their target cell. And they have, what do they have, the cells that want to attached to them, what they have in their surface. Receptors. So there's ones on the outside, and then obviously where the other ones are going to be inside. So we have extracellular. What's the other word going to be? Inter, intra, intra. It's going to be the same ending. Extra and intra. What does inter mean? International flight. Inter means between. Okay, so inter is between. Intra is within, inside. So we're going to have extracellular receptors that you saw up there. Um, this is something I'm going to keep repeating, and then you're going to see it written eventually. So what, what's that? Extra or intracellular? Extracellular. And then when it goes inside, there'll be an intracellular receptor. I'll show you another clip for that later on uh, in this lecture. And then there are some that come along, and they're not going to have anything uh, to fit to. Okay, so let's do some more comparing and contrasting here with this chart idea. So another category you can write, uh, um, comparing nervous and endocrine system, is... Which one is going to get their chemical throughout a lot of the body? The endocrine or the nervous? Endocrine, right? Because how is it traveling again? Yeah, through the bloodstream. So the endocrine, so we would say, I don't know, amount of body covered could be a category, something like that. You would get more of the body covered through the endocrine system because you're traveling through the blood. The nervous, you would have a lesser, we could say more localized area of the body because it's specific neurons you're traveling through to specific areas, uh, just like wires. The other one, um, which one's going to be faster in terms of, let's say, transmission speed? I'll put that as a category. The nervous system. So transmission speed, nervous system is faster. We talked about A fibers, they travel about 300, 400 miles per hour, versus the endocrines go through the blood, so it's just the blood flowing through our body. And, you know, that's not hundreds of miles an hour because you feel your pulse rate. It better not be going or it'll be tachycardia. So it's not that fast, but it can cover more of the body. So there's pros and cons to each of these. So here's another thing to think about, to add on there. If we're traveling throughout the blood, we can get to more parts of the body, but not every hormone is going to affect every cell of the body. Which cells are going to be affected? The ones that have what? receptors for the hormones. So you need receptors as well. So, I mean, you need receptors for neurotransmitters and you need them for hormones. So even though it's going throughout the whole body, just like you saw in that video, you need a receptor for it, whether it's extra or whether it's intracellular. So any questions up to this point? So we should probably have like you know, at least four rows or something of comparisons here. 
So different ways cells communicate. Again, it's a little bit of an intro right here. The nervous system, what's the connection between them called? You said it? The synaptic or synapse. So the nervous system communicates through the synapse. Cardiac cells, you guys remember this one? Very good. Gap junctions. I'll try to ask a harder one. What's that area called when you're looking under a microscope, those lines where gap junctions are? Very good. And a couple of you guys got that too. Intercalated discs. Intercalated discs. White blood cells and platelets. I didn't mention how they're communicating because it really wasn't that important at the time. But they do another type called paracrine secretion. Para just meaning around in that area. Platelets, what are they responsible for in our blood? Clotting. So they're going to release those factors, 1 through 13. That's a type of paracrine secretion. White blood cells as well too. If we think about the T helper, the T helper will activate the B cell. The B cell differentiates into what cell? Plasma and secreting antibodies. So if you want to make a picture large, if you're going to print it out, this is one that you could probably do that because it's a nice chart coming out of your textbook. So it's just showing you here direct communication through gap junctions. This is paracrine, the nearby, such as cytokines coming out of the T helper. Endocrine through the bloodstream and then synaptic communication down below. So again, this is just a nice little chart, shows you lots of comparisons. I recommend if you get a chance to print it, you should. Now I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to work together for a few minutes. And let me tell you here. So we talk about hormones. For example, name, name me some hormones that you guys already know or whether we discuss them. Estrogen. All right, so we do all the sex hormones, testosterone, progesterone. What else? Serotonin. Diabetics, what? Insulin, glucagon. All these hormones fall into different classes. And there's three different classes of hormones. That's why I made you a big chart here. And I apologize, I didn't upload it earlier so you can print it out in color. But this is another one. That it's like the big flow chart we made earlier for the, for the immune system. This is, this is one of those type of charts right here where it helps us summarize a lot of things. <clears throat> for example, I would ask you, uh, again, you can't read it up here on the screen. You can actually probably see this one better on the paper. <coughs> large. I ask you, let's say, epinephrine. What, which one of the three classes does epinephrine fall under? What's that? Which one of the three classes? I'm asking the three. Yes. Yeah, Amino acids, the blue one up top. So this, again, it's a nice summary thing because there's all these hormones that go throughout the body. Hormones could be neur neurotransmitters as well, too. It just depends. Are they secreted through the blood or are they secreted through nerves? So hormones can be ne uh, neurotransmitters. It just depends on how they're secreted. So what I want you guys to do is, uh, bless you. Uh, don't say this. You probably know the answer, even though I'm going to tell you right now. Figure out what AAs are. Don't say it. I know you guys probably already know. And then there's two types of AAs. You're going to look at your chart and figure out what those two types are and then fill in the other two classes inside here. And then just look at the chart for like a minute or two because I'll ask you more questions about it. So take a minute or two and fill that in.
Okay, let's go uh, through this here. So AAs are what? Good, amino acids. What's the first one that's listed up top there? Good. Tyrosine. So tyrosine is one of those amino acids. And then I'll give you guys a chance to say that one, next one there. Trip, tryptophan. So tryptophan and tyrosine. They're one of how many amino acids that we have used in our body that we can make? They're 20. They're one of 20 amino acids. There are 22 out there in nature, but our body can only synthesize or use 20 of them. So uh, again, they're one of the 20 amino acids. Amino acids, when you put them together, they're not going to make carbohydrate. What are they going to make? A peptide. A peptide is a what? Chain amino acids, protein. Okay. Protein and peptide are the same thing. If you have two amino acids making a peptide, you're going to call that a what peptide? Dipeptide and three? Tripeptide. Many amino acids? Polypeptide. Okay, so usually when you get to the level of polypeptide, that's when you call it a protein. So either one, peptide, hormones, or proteins. But if, if you take a look at the first category, there's amino acids, and then you see peptides, and you're probably wondering, well, why is that not the same? Why are they different categories? Because when you look at them, these are just single amino acids, amino acid derivatives. They're also known as amines, tyrosine and tryptophan. You're taking them, and you're going to chemically change, change them to different things. So it's one amino acid changed, which I'll show you examples here. In the, <coughs> the peptide is a chain of amino acids, so it's, it's still different. And what's the other category? Lipids. So you guys named for me estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. If you look at your chart, that's going to fall under which of the three classes? Lipids. So those are going to be uh, made out of lipids. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, all those are going to be amino acid derivatives. Here's a little tip. When you look at peptide hormones, there's going to be a bunch of them. I know we can't read it up here, and definitely should make a bigger picture of this. Any peptide, or any, sorry, any hormone that ends in the letter H, like when it's written out as abbreviation, for example, TSH, FSH, LH, ACTH, is going to be what class? It's going to be a peptide hormone. So anything that ends in the letter H is going to be a peptide hormone. How does that help you when you're, you're being asked which one of the following are peptide hormones? The first thing you should do, I mean, it's not going to be 100%, it's going to work, is look for anything that has an abbreviation with the letter H at the end of it. The H does stand for hormone. Everything is a hormone, but these are special ones that get abbreviated when you write them out with that letter H. So whenever you find that, 100% of the time, that's a peptide hormone. What I'm saying not 100% of the time is there are other ones that don't end up the letter H that are still peptide hormones on them. But that's like the easy, quick way that you try first. And then you look later if you don't find those. But we'll, we'll learn about those different ones here. So if just look at this here. I made it a little bit bigger. And, uh, this one maybe you could print out bigger. I just clipped the other picture. And I want to highlight this point here. Amines. Why am I highlighting it? Because on the test I wrote acidophilia, acidophils. He didn't recognize it as what, what's another name for it? Which other fill? Acidophils also eosinophil. So there's more than one name for these things. So amino acid is a name for the category, and amines is a name. If you're thinking about the question, the answer is parasites. But um, this is another name is that amines, okay, amines is another name for amino acid derivatives. So make sure you understand not just one name for something, that you have two names for it if they have it as well too. So it comes off of those two, tyrosine and tryptophan. Which one of those two, when you look at them, produces more hormones or neurotransmitters since they're actually both? Tyrosine. Tyrosine makes thyroxin, which is your thyroid hormone, T4, and it makes epinephrine, or epinephrine, dopamine. So there's four. This one just makes melatonin. What's melatonin involved in? 
in the sleep-wake cycle, coming from the pineal gland up in the brain. So, see, these, these are questions, right? It's not directly written on there. If I asked you which one produces more neurotransmitters or more hormones, right? You're going to look for your packet. Where's that answer? Well, it's there. You just got to make sense out of that. So, again, you got to understand where the amino acids, look at that, and divide it there. Any questions with that part? Okay. So, here's what I'm talking about when I'm saying they get converted or changed into. So, TYR, that's tyrosine. Again, what's the other amino acid? Tryptophan. So, they sound similar, but make sure you don't confuse them. This is possible extra credit material on the exam. Tyrosine creates all these other different neurotransmitters. Because when you're looking up here, you see like there's all these arrows and lines. They all start from tyrosine. Because remember, the category says derivative. So it's coming from tyrosine. So tyrosine becomes L-dopa, which does not mean dopamine. It's uh, dihydroxyphenylalanine. It's a different uh, compound. And then that produces dopamine. Dopamine, very important for Parkinson's patients. I'll talk about that in a second. And it'll help you out with extra credit if you haven't done that yet in the unit. Dopamine gets converted to norepi. Norepi gets converted to epinephrine. But again, what's another word for epinephrine? Adrenaline. These are things if you don't remember, you want to take note of because you're going to be looking like, if you said the extra credit's right here, I don't see, I don't see adrenaline on that. What's going on? Well, you want to know the other names for it as well, too. And what's the other name for norepinephrine? Noradrenaline. So why is this important, this whole pathway? Well, Parkinson's patients, they're depleted, an area in the brain called the substantia nigra. It's depleted of neurons that secrete dopamine. And that's important, as you can tell, for what? Because Parkinson's patients, what's wrong? Shaking. Shaking. Also a little bit with memory as well too. But there's the tremors as well. So dopamine is really important. So they need to get dopamine to their brain somehow if we're losing these neurons. The problem is dopamine can't cross what? Yeah, the blood-brain barrier. It just can't go through it due to its chemical structure. So what they did is they made a drug based off of L-dopa. L-dopa can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So you administer L-dopa, there's a little bit more to it, it's bound to another hormone, because if it's not bound, it's gonna be converted in the bloodstream before it gets to the brain, so it won't go in. But the main thing is they give L-dopa. L-dopa is gonna travel when it gets to the brain, and once it gets inside the brain, this protein will pretty much release it, and then it gets converted to dopamine inside there. So I mean, it's not a perfect fix, but it definitely helps with the symptoms of the tremors and the memory loss and all of those things as well too. So that's something if I get into, you'll definitely see Parkinson's uh, being talked about in there. So any questions for that part? Okay, so again, that will help you with the extra credit if you're gonna do it. So this is just showing you what do I mean by amino acid derivatives. As you can tell, tyrosine's up top there, not tryptophan. So tyrosine gets converted. Uh, we add this group. Does anybody know what an OH group is called? Yeah, hydrox, hydroxide group. So this enzyme is called tyrosine hydroxylase, ACE, it's an enzyme. It's taking tyrosine and hydroxylizing it, putting in OH. So it changes, and now it's called L-dopa. L-dopa gets decarboxylated, which means it loses this uh, COO group here, and then it has a hydrogen in its place, and then we have a beta hydroxylase, putting another hydroxide group. This is norepinephrine here and we add the OH instead of the hydrogen. It's called beta because this is uh, the alpha carbon, this is the beta carbon over here, so it's, it's adding it to the beta carbon. So again, there are a lot of organic chemistry in that area, but I'm just trying to show you what it means to be an amino acid derivative. You're coming off of an amino acid and you're making other neurotransmitters. Again, what's another name for the category amino acid derivatives? It means. Proteins. Proteins are chains of what? Chains of Again, don't look for a category answer and say, I don't see the word proteins there. What are proteins? Well, they're chains of amino acids. So, you know, that could be something as another answer choice. 
So make sure you're not just memorizing. The big thing in physiology is your understanding. And then you see a bunch of them here. And what did I say? How can you pinpoint a peptide hormone? Yeah, usually it'll we'll have an HF end of it. As you can see, there's a lot more. But if it has an HF end of its abbreviation right over there, it's going to be a peptide hormone. There's a lot more than that up there as well, too. And so hopefully you guys got that H down now. It stands for hormone. Yeah, not hydrogen, but it stands for hormone. There's thyroid stimulating hormone. It's not coming from the thyroid. It's going to stimulate the thyroid to make thyroid hormones. And we'll talk about that when we get there. LH, FSH, these are your sex hormones, the luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone, the reproductive ones. They'll produce the maturation of sperm and the maturation of the ova, and then also uh, the secretion of your sex hormones, the testosterone and the estrogen. Again, we will come back to this. ADH, you have seen this one before, antidiuretic hormone. What organ? Kidneys as well, it works with aldosterone. Aldosterone does salt reabsorption. ADH does water reabsorption. We reabsorb salt, water will passively follow, we increase blood pressure. So again, we will come back to all of these as well. I'm just trying to give you ideas. Does anybody know what GH is? Good. Growth hormone, we'll be building up bones and muscle. And EPO, you saw that in the last unit. Good. Erythropoietin stimulates the development of what cells? the red blood cells. So these are just some examples, but if you want to see all of them, all of them, they are up there. You can see LH, TSH, FSH, and what they stand for on the chart as well too. But again, we're going to come back and cover the majority of these hormones. The third class here, lipid hormones. Lipid hormones, a big one. You guys told me the sex hormones. So what are the three main ones that are going to go in those blanks? Estrogen, progesterone, and the male one, testosterone. Okay, I say the male one, I say the female one, but everybody has all of them. The thing is they're in different amounts. They're in different quantities. And then adrenal hormones, glucocorticoids. Example is going to be cortisol. We'll talk about that when we get to the adrenal gland. The mineral corticoid. What's the one that's in the kidneys that's reabsorbing salt that I just said a while ago? Aldosterone. Aldosterone is a mineral corticoid, the mineral being salt that's helping to reabsorb. Glucocorticoid, cortisone, gluco, what are you thinking when you say gluco? Sugar, so it's going to have to deal with that. That's going to be released in moments of stress. When I give you guys your exam, you'll be releasing that. So it's going to help give you energy uh, to your brain. And also has uh, an immune function as well too. But again, we'll, we'll talk more about those when we get to them. But those are all lipid derivatives. They're coming off of lipid hormones. Now, this is important here. We're going to see a big, crazy picture on the next slide. Cholesterol. All of these lipids are coming from cholesterol. Society teaches us cholesterol is bad, but it's good. It needs to be limited. Cholesterol, we find it on the plasma membrane. What is it doing to the plasma membrane? provide strength or also be too fluid and it wouldn't have a structure to it. So cholesterol is good there. Cholesterol is good here. It makes our hormones, our estrogen, our progesterone, all these other hormones. So it's good, it just has to be limited is the thing. So here's this picture. At one point in time, I did have to memorize it. And again, if I was giving you a complete um, open book test, there should be no problem if I was going to test you on all of these, but I'm not. How this chart works, it's showing you all the lipid hormones. What are they starting off again, as you see up there? Up at the top, not colored, cholesterol. All the way up top here, all the lipid hormones, they're starting off as cholesterol. They are derivatives of it. For example, and I encourage you to take your time sometime and look at it. It's pretty interesting here. Cholesterol, we go through these chains of events. Let's say we go down here, and we go all the way over here. Every time we cross one of these lines, that's an enzyme that is involved in the process of changing cholesterol. So cholesterol will get changed by 17, uh, what's that letter, that Greek letter there? Uh, alpha hydroxylase. So what's hydroxylase putting? What two elements on there? Oh, okay, so it puts that on there. 
and then lysase, we're gonna be breaking things down. So there's enzymes, for example, to get to the estrogen, we need aromatase. Why is this important? Well, in school I had to memorize all this because if there's a deficiency in one of them, then somebody like this one, if somebody that has a genetic defect can't make aromatase, they can't make what? They can't make estrogens. So that's going to be a problem, especially for females, right? I mean, male have a little bit too, but not in the same quantity. And then aldosterone, if we don't have this hormone, and you see it in red, it's coming from the mitochondria. So where do we inherit our mitochondria from? Yeah, from the mother's side. So if you have a mitochondrial defect and didn't inherit, you won't be able to make aldosterone. You can't reabsorb salt from the kidneys. And then that's going to affect your blood pressure. So these, this is all important in showing you these lipid hormones are all coming off of cholesterol. So again, I'm trying to stress it so you guys know that. So any questions before we jump into the next classification of there? All right, so let's, let's just name them. Let's do a little recap. We have amino acid hormones. They're also named what? It means the two, tryptophan and tyrosine. Which one of those two makes the majority of them? Tyrosine. After that, we have a chain of amino acids. We call those what? Peptides or protein hormones. How can we tell uh, most of these are peptide hormones when we see them in a list? There's an H at the end of them. Again, there's a lot more than that, but that's a nice, easy way. And then what's the third class? Lipid hormones, they're all derived off of what substance? Cholesterol. Good. So these are things when you go home, review it, make a nice flow chart off of that, and you guys, I guarantee you, will do well. And any details you miss, you come back and look where it is. So hormones are going to travel through what again? Through the bloodstream. There's a problem though. When they're traveling through the blood, yes? Did you see some that are like more Yeah. And that depends how they're secreted. For example, if you look over here uh, at the chart, you'll see epinephrine, right? You recognize that as a neurotransmitter because it's secreted through the nervous system. But it can be secreted through what as well too? Through the blood. And that's gonna be coming off the adrenal gland. So when we get to the adrenal gland, the inside, not the cortex, but same type of naming, the inside is not cortex. Do you remember that part? like the kidney, cortex, and yeah, the medulla. Yeah, you know, I know you know it's coming back. But cortex and medulla, the medulla of the adrenal gland will secrete epinephrine from there into the bloodstream. So if it's through the bloodstream, it's, they call it horn. If it's through a nerve, it's a neurotransmitter. So that's why some overlap. Yeah, that's definitely a good question right there. Okay, so, uh, when they travel, they can travel free or bound. If they're traveling free, that's usually a problem because they can be broken down by the enzymes inside the bloodstream. And you want to protect them to get to the organs they need to get to before they're uh, acted upon. For example, insulin. Insulin is going to lower what again? Blood sugar. But it doesn't make the, the sugar just disappear. It's got to go somewhere. When we, you know, prick the finger, which a bunch of you have been doing this week, you can test blood sugar and you measure it. But in order to lower it, you gotta store it somewhere. Does anybody know where in the body we store sugar? What's that? Sorry? Well, yeah, you're gonna eventually use it to make it easy. But But there's like other organs that we can store them inside. The liver, yeah, the liver is a big place to store it. What's the word for fat cells? Adipocytes, that's why if we eat a lot, Carbs gets converted to sugar, gets stored as fat. So we'll be looking at that as well too. So uh, in digestive system. So liver, adipocytes, and muscles. So those cells are going to have receptors for insulin. So when the insulin travels, it's going to be traveling, and then most likely it's going to be bound to something until it gets to where it needs to get to. So we, we have free hormones. The free ones. They're going to last, this is a short time. One hour is considered a short time right, through, throughout the bloodstream. When they're going to travel for a long time, and now I'm going to start to show you a McGraw-Hill clip, they're going to be bound. They're going to be bound to a protein you should know if I ask you is the most common plasma protein.
not the hemoglobin, the al albumin, yeah, the other one. Yeah, so plasma, the most common plasma protein, that's going to be albumin. Okay, so that, that's the blank that's up there. So again, when they travel through the blood, they're going to be bound to albumin. So I just mentioned that fact to you guys last time. But now you're seeing it in play. Okay, so they're going to be bound. It's kind of like here comes a hormone through the blood. If it's in the blood, it's going to be broken down. You want to prevent it from being broken down. So you're going to encapsulate it. You're going to protect it with albumin until it gets to where it has to get to. Then it's going to be released. So let me show you now a clip of that. If you uh, want to find these clips, you go to Google, because I didn't put a link for it, and you type in McGraw, M-C-G-R-A-W, space, endocrine. So again, you type in McGraw, and then endocrine. It's going to be the first result when you get uh, your Google results. Click on that, and it will take you to this page. And on the left-hand side, it will say animations. Anytime you go to McGraw-Hill videos, you're always looking for animations on the left-hand side. So you click on it, and it will show you three different ones. Steroid hormones. I want you guys to look at your big chart that I gave you. Steroid hormones fall under what category of hormones? Yeah, they fall under lipids. Steroid hormones are lipid derived. So I'm going to show you two things here. One, here's a steroid hormone. It's traveling through the blood. What do we call this layer right here of a cell? The phospholipid bilayer. Now, I said there's two types of receptors. There's extracellular and there's what? Intracellular. So I want you guys to, well, I don't need to draw this up. I'll use this up here. I want you to take a second and discuss this with each other and see if you guys agree. You have to think about simple diffusion. Simple diffusion means something is going to go straight through this membrane. There was another type that required something to go through it because it was water soluble. So what I'm trying to tell you is out of the, the three categories, actually I'm going to narrow it down to two right there's lipid uh, hormones and there's peptide hormones. Forget about amino acids for a second. There's lipid and there's peptide. One of those types is going to go through, have an intracellular receptor. The other type is going to have an extracellular receptor. So just take a minute and just think about it. See if you guys agree with one another. Which one has an intra, which one has an extracellular receptor? Compare the lipid with the protein. Again, think about what the plasma membrane is made out of. All right. Sounds like you guys, maybe you already know it. Which one is going to go through, lipid or peptide? <coughs> the lipid one is going to go through. Right? Because whatever, that's what simple diffusion is. Because whatever it's made out of, for example, this is a phospholipid membrane, it can go through it much easier than anything that's water soluble, such as peptide hormones. The analogy I was trying to give, like let's say, you know, here are some guards here, and some soldiers are coming through. They're going to let their own guards through. They won't let ones that are not made of the same type go through. So lipid soluble are going to have intracellular receptors. Water soluble, such as peptides, are going to have what? Extracellular. So this is something I'll give you a second to write on your chart before I play it. And if you get that big chart right there, under lipid hormones, yeah. under lipid hormones, they have what type of receptors? The lipids are going to have intra. Yeah, you, I know, you said it previously. So the lipids are going to have intracellular receptors. They're going to go inside. The peptides are going to have extra cellular receptors. And I might as well give you the other one now. Amino acids, it depends on what it is. So if we look at thyroxine, thyroxine is coming from what glands? It says it above it. Yeah. The thyroid. 
If it's a thyroid hormone, it's going to act the same as a lipid hormone, so it's going to have what type of receptor? Intracellular. So again, the one all the way at the top right, thyroxine, is a thyroid hormone, it's going to have an intracellular receptor. So that means the rest of those in the category have what? Are going to have extracellular receptors. So that's the part that throws people off because there's, they think that category is one or the other. But amino acids, okay, they're small, they could go through, but their chemical nature is something else you have to take into consideration. So if it's thyroxine, it's going to be intracellular. If it's the rest of them, they're going to have extracellular receptors. So today we're going to just look at the intracellular ones. So again, go back to this clip. It's the first one that I showed you on the McGraw-Hill page. SS represents a steroid hormone. What is this protein that's going to be bound to? That we carry through our blood? Good. It's going to be albumin. So that's back in that slide here. A transport protein, that's going to be albumin. There are other transport proteins as well too. We'll talk about it when we get there. But the majority, as you see, are going to be albumin. Steroid hormones are not water soluble. They travel in the blood attached to protein carriers. When steroid hormones arrive at their target cells, they dissociate from their protein carriers and pass through the plasma membrane of the cell. Some steroid hormones bind to specific receptor proteins in the cytoplasm and then move as a hormone receptor complex into the nucleus. Other steroids travel directly into the nucleus before encountering their receptor proteins, not shown. The hormone receptor protein, activated by binding to the hormone, is now able to bind to specific regions of the DNA. These DNA regions are known as the hormone response elements. The binding of the hormone receptor complex has a direct effect on the level of transcription of that site. Messenger RNA, mRNA, is produced, which then codes for the synthesis of specific proteins. So, just to backtrack through this video here, if I rewind, we have a steroid hormone. What is it bound to right there? Yep, albumin would be the protein carrier. And then it's going to get to the cell. And because it's bound, will it last longer or shorter in the bloodstream? Longer, good. And go through the phospholipid bilayer. Has what type of receptor? Intracellular. I'm going to show you, uh, actually you tell me, which one has an intracellular receptor out of the amino acid derivative hormones? Again, which one has an intracellular receptor out of the amino acid derivative hormones that I just told you to? Thyroxine. When you look at thyroxine, it's going to have intracellular, but the receptor is not going to be in the cytoplasm. Where is it going to be, you think? I'm pointing it here. It's going to be in the nucleus. So you'll see that difference. I'll show you that next. So it's going to go, this goes as a complex. The other one you'll see, the receptor is going to be waiting, and then that's going to go through. So what's this thing down here? Yeah, so it's going to bind to the DNA. They just call it hormone response elements. So I'm not going to ask you about that, but that's the region it binds to. And it makes sense if you just uh, listen to that word. And then we do DNA, and what are we making off of DNA right there? Yeah, messenger RNA. What do we call that process? Transcription. That goes out there. What is going to encounter it? Ribosome. We're going to make what off of that? Protein. That process is called uh, translation. Very good. So we go here to the next slide. And we're still talking about this stuff here. It says because they travel in the blood, they can alter the metabolic activities of few or many cells. Many. But they're not going to attack, or not attack, but target every cell. What does that cell need? It needs a receptor for it. So they can get to it. For example, thyroid hormone. We'll go to a lot of them because a lot of these tissues will have receptors for them. So target cells are the ones that have the receptors for the hormones. That's the target. That's where we're aiming to go to. Yeah, we'll go all over the place through the blood, but where do we want to end up with? The target cell that has the receptor for that hormone. And when they bind, you just saw here in that clip, eventually we're going we're gonna to make proteins here at the end. 
So these proteins can do several different things. They can turn things on or they can turn things off in the body, which we'll talk about as well too later on. Just another word for on and off is, I uh, should have written here, activate, is activate or deactivate, or inhibit is another word I'll be using as well. So deactivate or inhibit. It's just common words we'll be using when we're talking about endocrine system. Now, uh, let's let's get this slide down here. The next one, uh, you guys should know that blank. Give me a second to read it. The intracellular receptors. But what are these proteins going to do? So, okay, we're going to make proteins, but what are these proteins going to do? Well, for example, insulin is going to act to lower what? Again, in our blood. Yeah, blood sugar levels. So, <clears throat> if I go back here to this video. We're going to assume there's a lot of sugar out here in the blood that you don't see in there. So we got to take it out of the blood. What happens to lower it, it goes into cells. Cells of our liver. Does anybody know the word for the liver cells? I'll give you a second. You'll put it together. Yeah, pep. Hepa. Yeah, good. Hepatocytes. Hepatocytes will be liver cells. Or adipocytes, which will be what cells? Fat cells. So these cells are going to have receptors for insulin. So insulin will cause a series of things to happen. And then, not like this though, not like the video we're seeing. Because insulin is which class? Well, I shall ask you a direct part of question. Insulin is going to have intra or extracellular receptor. You got to look at your chart to figure this one out. Insulin is going to have an intra. So now this is how the harder questions will be asked. Insulin is going to have an intra or extracellular receptor. Why extra? Yeah, it's a peptide. So if you look under the class of peptides, you find insulin. And then you know it's insulin, so it's going to be, it's a peptide hormone, it's going to be an extracellular receptor. So again, you would see a question. I'd say, you know, for example, I just said insulin, what type of receptor? You're like, well, I don't see that written anywhere in the packet. But you're going to look under the category. I know this category has extra cellular receptors. So anyways, getting back to this, is we will create proteins regardless, whatever the receptor. The proteins can uh, create membrane channels so that we can bring glucose in from the blood. So that's like a function of one of these proteins and what they're doing. So let me just show you thyroxine. Thyroxine is abbreviated T what if you look at your chart? It's abbreviated T4. What type of receptor is this going to have? Yeah, it's going to be intra. What class is it coming off of? Yeah, amino acid. Yep, or amines. Similar idea. If you're looking up, what's that? Tryptophan is an amino acid. Oh uh, no, that's going to be triiodothyronine. When we get to the, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. When we get to the the thyroid gland, you'll see it, T3. So <coughs> yeah, you will see T3 and T4 here. Don't worry about those. When we do thyroid, we'll talk more specifically about them. But something I want you to get here is that's going to have intracellular receptor T4. It's thyroxine. That's on your chart. It's an amino acid derivative. Again, when we're bound to hormones in the plasma, what's the more common horm uh, protein we're bound to? Albumin. Okay. Now pay attention to where the intracellular is going to be located in this one, the receptor. Thyroxine is a water-insoluble hormone that is brought to the target cell via a protein carrier. Because it is little filling, thyroxine can easily pass through the cell membrane. Thyroxine contains four iodines and is often abbreviated T4. Tetraiodothyronine. The thyroid gland also secretes smaller amounts of a similar molecule that has only three iodines, called triiodothyronine, T3. Both hormones enter target cells, but all the T4 that enters is converted into T3. Thus, only the T3 form of the hormone enters the nucleus and binds to nuclear receptor proteins. So the the inside hormone receptor protein complex, in turn, binds to the appropriate hormone response elements on DNA. The binding of the hormone receptor complex has a direct effect on the level of transcription at the site where it binds. The messenger RNA 
mRNA produce then codes for specific proteins. So same idea, intracellular, just it's a different location uh, inside. I won't get that specific on you where the intracellular is located, but <clears throat> they're both intracellular receptors. The word I want you just to get off of this slide here is to understand what soluble means. Soluble means it can be dissolved in it. For example, if I have a container of, let's say this was water, and I pour salt and I pour oil, which one is water soluble? The salt, good. So the salt will dissolve and it's soluble in it. So again, this is just saying if it's made of lipid, it's lipid soluble. And that's the blank there I'm trying to get. So what's the bridge here to this material is that um, thyroxine is what? Lipid or water soluble? It's lipid soluble because it goes through the lipid membrane. It has intracellular. It's a lipid category in a sense. Uh, well, no, sorry. It's lipid soluble means it can go through. It's not made of lipids, but it's lipid soluble, which means it can go through. Uh, another one, peptides, that group of hormones. Lipid or water soluble? Water soluble. So here's something you can write. All water soluble hormones are going to have what type of receptors? Extracellular. What's the other statement? All lipid soluble have intracellular receptors. But just because I said lipid soluble doesn't mean lipids. What's the other one that's included in that category that we just saw right now? Thyroxine. So lipid soluble doesn't mean it is lipid. It just means it can you know, go through that substance. So thyroxine is lipid soluble, so it's going to have an intracellular receptor. So that's again one of those things that these questions that somebody here would miss, but you guys, when you get those good notes, you'll be able to get uh, those type of questions. Just let me make sure. Just want to make sure to see if you guys have any questions right now. All right, so that's going to be it today. Next time we'll get into the extracellular receptor stuff.